All right. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, so this is going to be hopefully not too long DevRel learning talk about the uh, Python package tournament. Uh, this is the front end. You may be familiar with it. Um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, the backend server, um, kind of a brief overview of how it's put together and what was necessary to support this infrastructure. Uh, and then Don's going to take it over and talk a little bit about actually building out the front end for this. Um, so I've got a bunch of stuff already opened. Um, and the first thing, I'm going to jump through some tables that are actually on the server. Uh, the server is still up and running. Um, and at the end of the day, the most important thing that the server is pulling down is, is called this match results table. And so this has um, all the, the, the tallied results from the different rounds and the different matches and the different teams and whether it's final or not with their individual counts. Um, so this was a live table um, during the voting. And so, for example, when there was a transition between the round of 32 and the round of 16, um, these rows would stop ticking and these new rows would jump in and then the counts would start uh, coming in here. Uh, and then obviously um, this UI would um, actually update. I don't know if anybody actually saw it update in real time, uh, but it, it, it did work. Um, the other table that the front end subscribes to is this Teams table. Uh, so this is um, seed name and URL for all the different packages that we had. Um, pretty self-explanatory, but these URLs were used and these names were used to seed, you know, these links and the names and stuff like that. And then finally, um, I th think as partially a helper, there was a current round table that the user interface also subscribes to. So this ticked down from 32 to 16. Um, I guess I should describe the data structure a little bit more. Uh, so round of is how many teams there are. The match index uh, is um, uh, the two teams that were facing off and then team A and team B was, um, these were indexes into uh, this, this team seed right here. So for example, when we look at uh, this first row in this table, round of 32, match index zero, team uh, one versus 32 to figure out what that is, you need to look at that, this table. So this was NumPy versus Redis right here. And it looks like NumPy won that round. Um, if we go to the actual uh, server-side code, it's, it's built as an application script. Um, it was done in Groovy um, because there was a lot of integration points that I needed to do with the Java side. Um, and I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, and if there are questions later, we can dig into more specifics. Um, but there's a lot of, um, of, of stuff that I'm doing in Java um, and then just pulling into Groovy. Um, uh, because some of this stuff res um, involves um, either the data needing to be saved out and then pulled back in um, if the server restarts. And I didn't want to do that logic uh, inside Groovy itself. Um, and some of it um, has more transactional nature to it. And so that was easier to do there. Um, but a lot of the business logic for counting and aggregating, all that is done here in in the a Groovy script. So um, we've already seen the teams table, uh, we've seen the rounds table, or, or we haven't, we've seen the matches table. Um, actually, we've seen the match results. Um, but let's look at the data that, um, kind of the static data that seeds some of this. Um, so you saw the table version of it. Um, it is sourced from a CSV file that is just deployed along with the server. Um, this could be changed to 64, teams or 16 teams, but it was uh, 32 teams to begin with. Um, the rounds, there's a rounds table uh, that describes the end timestamp. Um, so this is just round of and then when it ends and that um, information was used um, in the user interface as well. Um, and then one other piece of static data that was seeded here, and I will note that I am blocking out um, all IP addresses, just uh, so we don't know somebody's public IP address. Um, but Don was testing and accidentally voted a, a bit too many times, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so I had to add this notion of IP um, block listing, and I added his specific IP address right here. Uh, this isn't his IP address, because I've just changed the numbers here so you, so you don't see it. 
um, but this was part of the application logic as well. Um, let's close that. Um, close that. I don't know why it's jumping over here. Okay, rounds. Um, so we we read our teams from CSV. We read our rounds from CSV. Um, uh, we've got some other uh, tables that are doing some transactional stuff. Um, but basically, the most important table is what we call the votes table. And so this is the table where when you input a vote, there's going to be a new row that's appended to the table. Um, and I'll go into the specifics of how that works. Um, but, but basically, the logic is um, we're going to filter it out so it's not from an IP block list. Um, then we're going to add in some match index data. Um, and then we're going to um, do a sorted last by timestamp. Um, and this makes sure that, let's say you vote in multiple times um, for a different user because users could change your vote. This just makes sure we're getting the last vote for each user per session, per round of per match index. Uh, and then we do a votes total. And so that just counts up all the votes for the current round uh, or the round of the match index in the team. Um, and then we bring it all together in this match results table that we've already seen. Um, and this is what the user interface primarily consumes. And again, this table at the end of the day looks something like this. I mean, it looks exactly like this, um, containing just the essential information that the user interface needs. Um, there's a couple extra helper stuff that I'm doing um, that is um, choosing the winner and then I'm pushing it back into uh, the application logic so it can do some stuff with that. Um, but let's look at where I'm hooking in uh, to do um, some other stuff here. Actually, let's jump to a couple more tables here. So we've already seen the rounds table. Um, we saw it in CSV form, but here it is in the uh, table form. Um, here is the match indexes or matchups um, as, they, um, as they started. And so this is basically just the match results table just without the results in here. Um, and a lot of these are just intermediate tables that aren't really important to the user interface, um, but were important while developing the app to interactively figure out how to um, pipe these things together. Um, here are the round winners um, for each round. And this, this is also something that was needed to be persisted to disk um, for a transactional um, for some transactionality concerns that we had around the server. Um, and so here is actually all the votes that came in. Um, this is a pre-filtered uh, table, um, kind of. Um, um, I don't know if I actually want to get into that, but um, there was some decoration that was done to it to get to the votes table, and that basically just adds in match index and then does a last buy on that. So this is kind of the this is the table that seeds the match results table. As you can see, uh, the first person to vote here uh, had a session and they voted uh, for a number of different teams, and we collect their user agent. We also collect their IP address um, for. Um, for last buying purposes, but I'm I'm not showing that column here. Um, if we jump into where I'm hooking into the server, um, basically I have got a, a servlet. I'm running a Jetty server, and I've got a REST server endpoint that I've added into our server at the vote, um, the vote endpoint. So when you click on your vote, um, in the March Madness blog uh, or in the website, um, it'll do a post request to this votes endpoint. And I think Don will be showing a little bit more of that later. Um, but basically um, it goes into uh, this piece of code right here. Uh, I'll, I'll dive to, into it a little bit more. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, all this code was kind of spun up um, in a very quick sprint. I think I did it in a day or two. And if you were doing it for a larger production use case, you'd probably take a lot more care and you probably wouldn't use servlets directly. You'd probably use Jersey or um, some of the other, you know, REST um, backend 
um, niceties that are available, but I was I was dealing directly with the servlet APIs. So I don't think we want to get too much into the servlet APIs, um, but we'll go through the logic here. Uh, so basically, I'm ex expecting a post uh, with the round of and the team ID. Uh, so we get the round and the team ID from uh, the front end. Um, we're also being proxied through an Envoy uh, Docker container. And, and as part of that process, it gives us the real IP address instead of the Docker container IP address. So we, we grab that out, get the user agent. Um, we get the remote address, which actually isn't used here because the X forwarded for is set. Um, we get some cookie information to keep, session, keep track of sessions. Um, and then we tell whether the response should set a cookie um, or whether um, not to set a cookie. And then basically we build up this vote. So again, it's the round of the team ID, the timestamp, the IP address, um, and the cookie session that they are using and the user agent. And then we append that to the votes table. And again, the votes table um, contains all that information, and, and that's what you see right here, timestamp session round of team match index and user agent. Actually, match index isn't part of this. Um, you'll notice right here, that is something that's computed later. Um, and then again, we set the cookie um, and uh, send it back to the user interface. Um, there's a couple other classes I want to show here. Um, the IP block list, I think we already saw that, but it's uh, this is how easy it was to, to read in that table. Basically, we just defined the header that we wanted and then read it from CSV, and then that was available uh, to, our, um, to our Groovy script right here. Um, let's see. Um, we can get into some more of the definitions if we want to. So the, probably the most important one is this votes table. So this is actually the thing that's processing the votes. So here is the header uh, to define the votes table. Um, again, timestamp IP session user agent round of and team. Um, since we do need to persist it across uh, server restarts, we do need to write it down to disk too, and that is being done using a CSV. So we have a, um, a similar definition when we're reading this file back in from disk um, if we need to. Um, and then it is, so when you append a vote, basically you're adding it to an in-memory table um, and you're pulling out the vote information. And then with a, um, uh, update graph processor lock, um, which we need for some track transactionality concerns that we have on the server. Uh, we ensure it's a, a valid vote. And that basically means that this team is part of this round. So once the round of 32 ends, you're not going to be able to vote for the round of 32 anymore. Or if your favorite team, if you try to vote for your favorite team in, a, in round 16, but it didn't make it to round of 16, um, this will be empty right here. So this this checks that the, the round of and the team ID is correct. Once we val uh, validate that the vote is a valid vote, um, we save it to disk, and then we add it to our um, our votes table. Um, writing in CSV is we uh, just dump it out. Um, and this is, again, only used for server restarts when we need a replay from the beginning. We will read this in. Um, and that's basically the server side um, of what's going on here. Um, there is um, a little bit of extra threading here that automatically will tick off to the next round and mark the winners. And so there's um, some threading uh, code that will do that here. Um, but yeah, it's basically we collect all the votes. And this is, again, from a, a Jetty servlet sourced um, in memory uh, input table, filter out the, um, the blocked IPs, uh, decorate it, uh, do some last bytes to make sure only the, the latest vote counts, uh, do the count, uh, and then construct the view for the, um, for the user interface. And with that, I will...
uh, hand it off to Don, um, unless we think we want to handle any questions right now. Okay, let's throw it over to Don. See my screen? Yeah. We're going to assume yes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about just the UI side of it. Uh, what, how, how I built out this UI based on the tables that uh, Devin provided me. Um, it's actually a pretty simple architecture. We have our regular React app that hosts our website. Um, and the Deephaven server app giving us tables. They push those tables over the JS API, and I send back votes with just a HTTP POST request, just using the native um, fetch API. Uh, so it subscribes to three tables: that current round table, which drives which round is open for voting; the teams, which it matches with these team IDs in the match results table to display the name and the URL, and then just there's some other information about match index, um, whether it's voting is still finalized or not, and then the team A and B counts, which are the actual vote counts. And then we express those vote counts as a percentage, just in case we had an embarrassingly small number of votes. We didn't want to advertise that, but uh, it turned out okay. Um, it was pretty simple that we were just subscribing to the whole viewport. Um, and then rendering that as a state. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with React, React is like really designed to render states of an application based on like a data structure. So it's like a declarative view for that data. So we had the table events coming in, but we didn't really care too much about that because we just wanted the whole viewport. And so we were getting just the whole thing when the viewport updated. Um, and then I did a step where I remapped that to just a JavaScript object. I could have worked with it as that like same flat uh, structure of the table, but it was just a little easier from a JavaScript side to rejigger that into uh, more of a traditional JS object. And then that object gets set to a React state. And then because that React state is set, the UI renders based on that state and what that current layout is. Um, so that sounds easy conceptually. You've got this JS object and you want it to look like this. The trickiest part of this was actually just doing the layout of this because it's kind of a weird non-traditional layout of how this bracket strategy works. Um, so it's kind of like this open CSS question of how do we go from this complicated layout to, to uh, from this object state to a complicated layout. So there's a number of approaches that you could have used. I mean, there's a whole different, whole bunch of different ways. Uh, you could have done like absolute positioning, calculated where everything needed to be just with math. You could have used some sort of nested flex boxes. The new kid on the block though is CSS Grid. Um, it's got wide browser support now. The only challenge was it also needed to work on mobile. Um, but looking at the layout of it, figuring out what I wanted to do, kind of became obvious to me that this would work well as a CSS grid, that there was kind of this underlying grid structure that you have these matchups sitting on this grid, and then the next matchup is still sitting on the grid, but just offset in position. And, but the complicated thing is you then get these weird offsets where, you know, there's two between it, and then three between it, and then five between it sort of thing, where you had to figure out what those offsets were. So that was where the biggest challenge would. Um, and then, of course, on mobile, CSS Grid is still great that you can easily just remap the orientation so that it was rendered this way on, on CSS Grid, but then just vertical column on mobile. Um, so anytime you're dealing with like an unusual layout that flows in two directions, CSS Grid is, tends to be the answer. Um, what it's doing is taking this flat rendered node list of a bunch of divs that represent like the bracket and then each individual matchup and transforms it into a dynamic 2D grid. Uh, for a little bit of background on how CSS grid works is you define what the templated columns is gonna look like. So, oh, I want to have seven columns or five columns or whatever. And then same with rows, I want 64 rows, 
and I want them to be this tall each, sort of thing. Um, you, you can also have it defined as like an implicit grid and just start positioning things and I'll kind of figure it out. But you do find that in terms of tracks. So each of these cells kind of represents a track of cells. Um, and then between the tracks are lines. And for whatever reason, they're indexed at one. So you have the first line, the second line, the third line, and fourth line. And if you want to position something on that grid, you're not positioning it in terms of cell position. Like this isn't zero, zero. Uh, this is would be starting at the first line and ending at the second line or starting at the first line, first column, et cetera. So to have something span uh, two tracks, you could have define this as like, it's a grid starting on grid row line two and starting on grid column line two, but then spanning two tracks. So it can be a little bit of a... Uh, odd API to learn, but once you learn it, you can very uh, cleverly position things. So the first thing we had to do was define what those tracks looked like. And that was pretty simple. It's just like, we have that team's table from Devon. We can just get the length of it. And that's the number of rows that we want for our table. And then the number of rounds, the only thing that gave us that is we know the team's length. Math log two of that gives us the number of columns we want, which is five. And then we can compute the temperate row and temperate column that defines that outer grid in terms of size and in terms of number of rows, number of columns. Um, there's something bit novel of where it's passing it as CSS variables to a style um, component or as style on the component, and then using that in the CSS to declare those grids and columns with the columns and rows. Um, so for this one, we had five column tracks and 32 row tracks. Again, the challenge became, how do we turn each match up to a position on them? So we can see that it's a match and a spanning two rows. And we can see that this pattern is a little bit odd, where we have all of the first column, and then the second column is one, and then two, and then two, and then it's three, and then two, and then it's five, and then I think four, et cetera. There's the question of how do we take these ground indexes, so the ground indexes go this way, and the match indexes for, you know, this. so this is this first matchup in that ground, so it's match index zero, and we're iterating through when rendering it, we're rendering out across the rounds, uh, and then, or sorry, down the matches and then across the rounds, what is this function that tells us what the column start and go start to position this matchup is based on having a ground index and match indexes are known values. And that was like just some heavy thinking and then giving up and asking Devin and Bender for some help on <laughs> what that formula actually is. And uh, the answer to that was the column start is easy. You know where it is. It's just the ground index plus one because we have to do that. You know, lot, the ground indexes were zero base, but then the lot, CSS grid lines are it, uh, one base. Um, and then the row start is this is the magic formula that kind of lays out everything. And with that, there's very little work after that. It's just two to the ground index plus two to the ground index plus one times the match index. Um, there was many false starts in trying to come up with that and having matches rendered all over in the wrong places in the grid. But then uh, it became pretty simple. We have this outer bracket component that renders the overall bracket and has that grid template laid out on it and then within that we had the various match components for every match and each match component had a loading state and a voting state and a result state um which was as shown on the grid um so the layout was the challenging part but there were also some not so fun js api parts as well uh as we know the js api started as like this internal only api and it had a very different use case of where we were trying to build a UI around displaying tables and interacting with tables um, in kind of ad hoc ways. But now we're kind of pitching it as this public API to use to build things and apps, and it's got some rough edges around it. Um, one documentation is very light. Um, there's not a plethora of examples that we have. They're not well documented. I mean, we'll, we'll get there on that. Just the current state of it was not easy. Um, and then another one, big one was it's not published as a JS module. It's pretty standard that I should be able to just like npm install this as a package and then import the client from a deep module. Instead, I had to do this mess of uh, 
important because it was within the great act app i had to you know just append these as javascripts from the host and that's kind of a weird way of doing it from a react developer standpoint and then um it's kind of expected nowadays to have typescript bindings so that uh you can have your code checked um at compiled before compiling uh to make sure it's all valid and there's not being published as the module and not having ty TypeScript bindings doesn't make that more difficult. Um, I also would say that we have a very large bundle size. The app itself was, you know, a few hundred lines of code and tiny, but then pulling in the JS API made it multiple megabytes. So I kind of expect us to not only have a module, but have a module that be tree shaken so that it only needs to import the things from the API that it needs. Like I was doing no date time manipulation, so I don't need a half a meg of time zone information. Right? So those were the kind of things that I expect, expect us to move towards. Um, I also found kind of like the API ergonomic, ergonomics were just kind of difficult. If you wanted all rows and all columns of a thing, uh, like this is subscribing to that teams table, right? But I didn't really care but what the goals were, I just wanted them all. So it's, it was kind of awkward for that. I've been talking with Bender about this, that it'd be very nice to have a React Turks wrapper around this, that for people working in React, to just make common UI things easy. Like as I talked about, we were mapping all those table events to a UI state, and that's a thing that everyone's going to have to do if they're using it in React. It'd be real nice to have that happen kind of behind the scenes and then like nice wrappers if i just wanted to like that current round table was just one single value that i wanted so it'd be nice to have a wrapper for that or all goes and all columns things like that um it's kind of different than like a different api use than driving a table where we need to be able to grab certain columns hide certain columns out of the viewport and you know, be very careful about how many rows we're fetching or not. But when you're building like discrete data driven UI elements where it's either like like this or like, you know, just a gauge chart or a simple bar chart, you need to just grab everything. Uh, so it'd be nice to have easier ways of doing that. Um, thank you for coming to my Bill and Ted talk. That's it. Any questions? Can you guys talk about some of the, the wisdom you've learned in implementing applications like this? Um, yeah, so on the JS side, it's definitely we need to beef up our documentation on it. That's so, and I think Colin is now working towards having JS as a module, a thing, but I, I think those were the two biggest things I'd like to see out of it. Um, on the server side of it, um, there is, you know, as a real-time database where we don't care about uh, transactions in, in the most part, um, it, it's a very different world that we work in. Um, and having, um, you know, voting is a very transactional thing. Um, either you have a vote or you don't have a vote, um, and we need to make sure you don't double vote, and we need to have these hard transitions between rounds. Um, there was a little bit of extra work and care that we needed to take around the transactionality of it um, from the back end side. Uh, and basically that just meant at the end of the day that I needed to have everything under the update graph processor lock um, while I'm checking for validation there. And then during a uh, startup, um, replaying uh, data to get back into the same state that it was before before shutdown. So, you know, I'm very excited about continuing, um, you know, Deep Haven app as an application uh, development framework. Um, and I think we do need to work on... Um, just that bifurcated nature of of in memory tables versus things that you want to persist from from run to run. Um, what I will say though is like I had a great time when I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier that um, 
Don was double voting um, a bunch of times with his IP address that I noticed. I noticed like a whole bunch of extra votes coming from a single IP address. Um, I was like, oh, who's this from? I was from Canada. It's probably Don. And it turned out he was he was using a local a local port to test some of his UI stuff, and it wasn't setting the session correctly because Corsal wasn't matching. Um, but anyways, like it basically took me. 10 minutes to go from not having any IP block list to adding that code into the application and restarting the server. So like when you're working with high level business abstractions and you have something that you want to add on, it was really easy from the application perspective to, you know, I'm basically just adding a new table and then doing a where not in and everything else is exactly the same. So I, I think it excelled in adding new business logic um, in that sense. Um, and then, like I said, there were some places where transactionality um, and persistence um, for applications uh, was a little bit rougher. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thanks, guys.